The Bible says a whole lot about loving one another. Whenever we start looking into certain passages such as 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 8 where he says there, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. He said, Love as brethren. Now what that tells me is that this is a specific type of love. We're not talking about a love that is simply just, well, I want you to just go ahead and just love them any way you want. No, we have a particular relationship together, and there is a specific type of love that needs to be there as brethren. And so we're going to be taking a little bit of a look at this this morning in the next few minutes. And I want to be thinking about point number one. Did you know that love is the signet? Now, whenever I use the word signet, the word signet simply means a token of or a sign of. And it talks about many different things. Like, for instance, uh, love is the signet to the world that we are his disciples. Remember there in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, we read this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, notice what he says in verse number 35. He says, by this... What, what is this? The love that you have for one another in describing itself as I have loved you. He says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Friends, I want to ask you a simple question. How would it be if you were going around, you were trying to find a congregation to attend... And you start going around, you start visiting around, and you start going into this body of believers that are all around and you see a bunch of backbiting, a bunch of griping, a bunch of this and that and everything of that nature. Let me ask you something. How many of us would really be like, yes, that's exactly the place I want to be? Uh, no, we, we tend to go towards the congregations where you feel the love of God there. Where you had the love, the kindness of hearts. You had the individuals who are always about, hey, whatever I can do for you, that's exactly what I want to do. How can I serve you better? You are worth my time. I value you. You know, those are the type of congregations that we tend to uh, sort of hold on to. And it's something that really stands out in my mind. I'm telling you, whenever we, we first came here... Then we tried out. I even told Brooke on the way back, I said, Brooke, this is a loving family. And that is something that was very well and very easy to be seen just by the way that we, that we saw you all treating one another and things. And we're like, this is where we need to be. And I was very, very thankful that the congregation here said we want us to be part of y'all. I'm very, very thankful for that. It is truly a signal to the world that we are His disciples. We have something in, within us that shows to the world of who they need to be longing to be. That we can actually make a difference in their lives. We're someone who can actually help them in their life to be better than they ever have ever been before. We need to be showing that. And the love that we have towards one another is that signet of that. Yeah, love is also the signet that we have passed from death to life. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 14, he says, Now we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Did you know that the way that our life is, did you know that the love that we claim to have is going to be shown? Did you know that? It, how many of us can really pinpoint an individual who says, hey, like to the wife, hey, I love you. And then all of a sudden starts beating her up. See, a lot of times people have that type of mentality that you can automatically clue into that, right? You can automatically see that that love that he has for her is not the love that she needs to have, right? That's not the love that he needs to be showing towards her. Guess what? Whenever we are together as a body of believers and we say, brother or sister, we love you, our actions should show just what we said. Not something of where, say, brother or sister, I love you, and then the next opportunity that I get, I'm back here going, can you believe what they did? Let me tell you something. I, did you see that dress that she was wearing? Huh? Right? That's, no. We need to be having the type of mentality, brethren, that it doesn't matter where you're going to be finding them. We're going to be the same person in front of them, behind them, 
It's the side of them, whatever. doesn't even matter what type of situation we're in. The love is going to be genuine, is what Peter says, that we need to have that genuine love for the brethren. And that's that non-fake love. That's that true love. And it's a sign that we have passed from death to life. Death, talking about that we have not changed our lives because we're still on the same track of going to hell. But it's a sign that we have changed because now I'm actually valuing others, not valuing myself. It's a sign that we have passed from death to life. It's also a sign that we are of the truth. 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, it says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Now this is a verse that my dad loves to use every time he moves us. He says, now Wes, I want to let you know something. I do not love you in word or in tongue, but I do love you in deed and in truth. Okay? I'm moving you. That says a lot. <laughs> but the thing is this. Whenever we think about uh, the phrase, if you're going to walk or talk the talk, you better walk the walk. We've heard that. And we can always spot a hypocrite in a heartbeat, Right? Whenever we say that we love one another, that means that we need to be able to show it. It should not be something that you speak one thing and you live another. Where you speak one thing and you do another. We need to be like as if we are talking, we need to be backing that up by our actions. Whenever we think about loving and how it was a signal that we are of the truth, that simply means that we are allowing this book, brethren to guide our lives, to shape our lives, to shape the direction of travel, to shape our minds to the point of where it then reflects in the actions that we have, yes, even in especially with how we treat one another. If we're back here gossiping and backbiting and things of that nature, does that mean that we are allowing our minds to be shaped by this or by what we ourselves want to talk about? We talked about that this morning in reference to Matthew chapter 15, how everything, all the actions of man is actually coming from the heart. So we think about it in that respect. We, we think that the way that we treat one another actually shows the type of heart that we actually have. And it's very, very important that we realize that. Not only is it a sign of the signet, but number two, it's also love is the treatment. Whenever you think about certain things such as the definition of what biblical love is, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, he goes into a description of really what this love is. Because if you want to put it all into context, remember chapters 12, 13, and 14 are all talking about spiritual gifts. And the interesting thing is chapter 13, actually right before that in the very last verse of chapter 12, he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Right? I'm not going to, I'm going to show you a way that you need to be treating one another because they were all high minded individuals. These were the individuals that were all about saying that my gift is better than your gift and things of that nature. He said, I'm going to show you a better way. And it's all about love. And he says in verse number four, he says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now I want you to picture in your, in your mind a congregation that is full of this. One who simply looks at one another that suffers long and is kind to one another. I want you to think about a congregation that there is no envy or strife. I want you to think about a congregation that does not parade itself, does not think of himself all puffed up, all thinking that I am better than you. Does not seek its own, does not behave rudely. It's not provoked. Where an action that you show towards me, I'm going to be responding back to that same reaction. One who does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. I'm not going to back up your sinful activity. But I'm going to care about your soul enough to bring it to the truth. And one who simply bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Brethren, you know what that is a true sign of? We are a family. 
Now, you think about that from a family aspect, talking about a physical family. A lot of times we, we use the phrase that blood is thicker than water, right? We, we, we say that. And what we mean by that is a lot of times we tend to defend our families more than we go out here and deal with our friends. But the thing is this. I want you to think about that from a spiritual aspect. As a family, when we stop the whole segregating part, whenever we stop the whole cliques within a congregation, and we start seeing each other as family, and that's exactly what we are. We are one big family. And we have these aspects. Remember how he said back there in John chapter 13, by this all men everywhere will know that you are my disciples, right? Right? Whenever we behave the way we need to behave, you better step back because some things are about to explode. You know why? Because people are going to notice. And it's not from the aspect of saying we're going to be the people that we need to be so that everybody else can be. No, 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 no. It's not about us. Okay? It's not about us. Because you remember, our whole entire aspect of life is not to be focusing people on ourselves, right? That, that should be just a given. That's the, the one thing that God has given to us, that influence. And if our influence is good, everything else is going to be good. Our influence is going to spread. It's going to be like that light, that blue light to a bug's life, right? It's going to then draw them to us, not focusing upon ourselves, because remember Matthew 5 verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, not glorify you, Right? He says, but glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our lives should reflect what God is because we would simply be impossible for, even, for us to even live a godly life if God did not allow us to do so. So when you think about it from that perspective, you have to then think that it's not about me. It's about bringing glory and honor to God, right? Do you love yourself enough and do you love the congregation enough to treat one another in the right way to bring glory to God? See, that, that's where the whole point lies. Whenever you think about another way, love is a treatment that sets example and uplifts others. In Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10, we read this. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. I love the ESV in this because he says this. Love one another with brotherly affection. Now watch what he says. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know what that means? That simply means that I'm uplifting you and you all of a sudden say, no, 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 I'm going to uplift you. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to uplift. Remember that as a kid? I'm always going to be better. No, no, I'm better. No, I'm better. No, 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 I'm better. I'm better. Okay. Reverse that aspect where it's not about focusing upon me saying I'm going to be better than you, but we're saying, no, you're better than me. No, 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 you're better than me. No, no, you're better than me. Better than me. Better than me. And you continue to do that. Now, whenever you do that, guess what happens? You bring about an aspect of uplifting the other above yourself. When you start thinking in those respects, you lose the whole entire mind frame of saying that it's not about me. You lose yourself. We need to get to the point of losing ourselves in our brethren. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12, love treats as you want to be treated. Now, I know we say, all oh, this is the golden rule. This is something that we've been raised in and all this, even in school. Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? Remember that little phrase? That's a biblical phrase, Matthew 7, verse number 12. Whenever he says that, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Could you imagine a world where everybody treated everyone else the way they themselves wanted to be treated? Could you, could you imagine a world like that? Because if that be the case, we wouldn't have the bullying in schools. We wouldn't have the school shootings of what happened this past Wednesday. We wouldn't be having all this junk that's been going around. But when people begin starting to look at themselves over others... You've started the seed down a long line of tragedy. Remember how James said, love covers a multitude of sins. Did, you know what that simply means? What that means is that if we automatically love each other the way we want or the way that we need to, guess what it does? It prevents things from happening in the future that would have taken place. 
Love covers a multitude of sins. And we, we always want the best for the future, right? We always want to say that I want to help that individual. I don't ever want to follow suit into a, a, a being the cause of a bad thing to be taking place, right? We, we don't like being that. Well, the way you do it is that you prevent that from taking place by the way you treat others right now. That's a very, very important aspect to that. You think about how love serves one another, Galatians 5, verse 13 and 14. For He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all, uh, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The life of a Christian is about service. It's not of, hey, what am I going to get out of this? It's about always serving. Remember how even Jesus himself said that the servant is not above his master, right? No, neither the master over his servant. Why? Because he even said that if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, what do you have to do? You be the greatest servant to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's reverse psychology of the way that the world thinks. You mean to tell me that the higher that I want to be spiritually speaking, the lower I've got to be physically? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's what we're all discussing here. Love is also something that sets others above ourselves there. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read this. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Guess what you're doing? He's basically pleading that we need to stop looking down and start looking out. You know that? Stop looking down and start looking out. You know what you do? Because guess what? Whenever you're looking down and everything, guess what? I'm only focused on my own feet, right? But when all of a sudden you lift your head up, you finally notice that you're not alone. You start looking around, you start seeing that there's other people around you. And guess what? Those people matter as much as you. But guess what? As a Christian, I need to learn how to say that we're not on level playing fields, but now I need to be uplifting you all. Which in return, guess what happens? If everybody has this type of mentality, guess what happens to you? They uplift you. And then they have the few, and you them, and they the you. And you see what I mean? That's the way it always is. We are about encouragement. We are about loving each other and doing this. It also seeks opportunity to do good. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10, a very familiar passage. We read this. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That does not mean that I'm going to be setting a day aside to all of a sudden uh, wait for you to tell me what you need. You know what that means? I'm going to be on the lookout in certain areas of how I can help you even without you even asking me. Oh man, could you imagine a congregation like that? Things start falling right into place, doesn't it? Where all of a sudden, you may not, you may not even know you actually have a need of something, but somebody else does and they help you in that. Ooh. You start looking around and you go, man, that's, a, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's the way the church is supposed to be. The brotherly love is a very important aspect. Number three, we can show love for God and love is actually what completes all things. Whenever you think about in 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 through 21, we read this. He says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in the, this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he, he, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? 
And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Love is the thing that binds everything together. It is simply impossible for you and me to love each other the way we need to if our love for God is not what it needs to be. It is simply impossible for us to say that I love God and I am currently loving God and mistreating you. Guess what? Whenever you get the vertical right, the horizontal will be made right. That's the way it happens. It's not a coincidence. If we have our love properly placed in where it needs to be lying, everything else falls right into place. It's also a completion of obeying the truth. Remember there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Since you have purified your soul in, in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Now I want you to think about this word right here. Through the spirit in sincere love. Sincere love simply means we do not have it on an off switch. That means that I love you 24 hours a day. That simply means that the way that I need to love you will always be the case. Because it is sincere. It's not a fake love. It's not something where I'm one wave in front of you. Oh, but hold on a second. I just turned my direction. Oh, you don't know, you don't know what I want to be saying about you next. Right? Love is something that needs to be genuine. It needs to be unfaked. Whenever you think about loving as a completion of right priorities, whenever you think about 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 17, he says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Love the brotherhood. A lover of good things. I think it's interesting how whenever you start looking here at the qualifications of the elders, one thing is that it says a lover of good things. You know what that means? You love the things that are good, those things that are profitable, those things that are beautifully put to bring about godliness. That is what you love, not trying to justify things, but you're loving that which is according to the book. Whenever you think about uh, showing progression, at what point in time does brotherly love need to be shut off? He says, let brotherly love continue. So it doesn't matter what may be uh, faced in our face or anything of that nature. What we're needing to be understanding is that love for the brethren needs to be done at all times and continuing to be done at all times. When you think about showing godly character, I think it's interesting how he says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5, he says, But for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, watch this, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. I think it's very, very important that we understand that this is the whole entire makeup of a Christian. Things we need to be striving for, things that we need to be, and watch this, he says, now if these things be in you and abound. Now that's verse number eight. You'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whenever you think about the word abound, what that simply means is never stopping, continuing to grow. So that means that my brotherly love can for you should always continue to increase, never get to the status of where I say, well, I love you at this point and I'm not going any further. Whenever you've been with a brother or sister for many, many years, you build that relationship, don't you? You, you understand where they come from. You understand their character. You understand who they are. You know their, their cliques. You also know what sets them off, what things eases their pain, Right? You understand that. And that's something that we can never master in totality with an individual. This is something that we continue to grow in. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. Abounding in brotherly kindness. Continuing to grow even more and more and more. So by way of conclusion, I want to ask you this simple question. How is God seeing our love for him when he sees how we love our brethren? Because remember how he already said in 1 John chapter 4, right? He says, how can you say that, that you love me if you don't even love your brethren who you have seen? How can you love me whom you have not seen? If we want to get our relationship vertically right, 
our relationship horizontally has to be right. So, if we want it right up, we've got to have it right out. So, think about terms such as that. How is, how, how is God looking at us and saying, how, is, how are we showing our love for Him by how we treat one another? Truly, it is the case, and as I started this whole entire lesson off, the way we treat one another will depend and will determine our eternal destiny. So I hope and pray that we will have that right today. How does a person start into the family of God to be part of his family, to be what God would have us to be? By simply hearing his word, Romans 10 and verse 17. By believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 verse 24. By repenting of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. By confessing his sweet name before men, um, Acts 8 and verse number 37. And being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Now, once you do that, in verse number 47 of Acts chapter 2, he says, and he was adding those members daily, those who are being saved to his body. So with that being said, I want to ask you this. If you're not a child of God today, do you want to be part of his family today? The water's ready. You've heard the word already. Do you believe it? Do you truly want to be what God wants you to be? This is what he says for you to do. Now, once you've done those things, God also expects, brethren, for us to live faithfully, which, guess what? That also includes how we treat one another. Where do we stand? Do we need to come to God? Do we need to change our lives? Do we need to repent publicly for the sin of not treating one another the way we need to? I hope and pray that you will have the courage to do so. If we can encourage you in any way to help you in any way, I hope and pray that you will come forward right now as together we stand and as we sing.